Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you very much for joining our virtual roundtable today. My name is Asma Latif, and this is my first FAO Alliance event in my new capacity as the Interim Executive Director of the Alliance to End Hunger. The Alliance is exceptionally grateful for its continuing partnership with FAO as we bolster our collective understanding of global hunger, agriculture, and nutrition issues, and work to advocate for effective policy solutions to some of the world's most pressing issues confronting our community. Today's topic, nutrition equity, has attracted increased focus over the last few years. 10 years ago, the international community responded to unambiguous evidence and growing consensus on the impact of maternal and child undernutrition on survival and on individual and societal health and and economic outcomes with the establishment of the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement. Two years later, the World Health Assembly adopted six global nutrition targets. And then in 2015, the Sustainable Development Goals included a goal to end hunger and all forms of malnutrition. A key principle of the Sustainable Development Goals is to leave no one behind, recognizing the need to start with the furthest away first. In effect, the SDGs have put equity front and center. In recent months, a number of new reports have focused on this issue, including the 2020 Global Nutrition Report, the latest State of Food Security and Nutrition, and putting on my other hat as Director of Bread for the World Institute, the Institute's 2020 Hunger Report, Better Nutrition, Better Tomorrow which emphasizes the inequities throughout the food system, from the smallholder farmers to food sector workers to consumers, all of whom cannot afford a healthy diet. As the COVID-19 pandemic has so clearly demonstrated, five years after the adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals, we have a long way to go. And in fact, we are backtracking. The inequities could not be more pronounced in most parts of the world, including in the richest country in the world. And the crisis has laid bare all of society's shortcomings. Lack of access to a healthy diet and good nutrition is driving uh, these disparities. If there is a silver lining, it is that the whole world is finally awakening to these inequities. It, it, I am pleased today to be part of such a wonderful group of individuals at the forefront of thinking about these issues. And I look forward to discussing how we can take some solid steps to make our food systems and nutritional outcomes more equitable for all. Um, this webinar is being recorded, so please use uh, the the chat box and the Q&A to, to put your questions. Um, and uh, in the chat, um, we will be adding the full bios of the distinguished panelists. Um, so please use the chat box and the Q&A to really engage and make this a very interactive uh, session today. Um, we'll start off, and it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Vimalendra Sharan, director of the FAO Liaison Office for North America. Vimalendra, thank you again for your leadership and partnership. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Asma, and on behalf of FAO and Alliance to End Hunger, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to today's webinar. I thank you for making it convenient to tune in and participate, and a special welcome to our keynote speaker, and our panel of experts for taking time out and agreeing to share their thoughts and ideas with us. I, for one, am really excited to hear the multiple perspectives today's discussion will bring because we have experts from different agencies, different organizations, and bringing different viewpoints and ideas on the issue of nutrition and healthy diets. Over the last many years, now, we have often heard that there is enough food in the world to feed the global population. But what I think we haven't heard often enough is whether there's enough nutritional food for everyone. 
where that is accessible to everyone to ensure healthy diets for all. Unfortunately, this question has neither been asked nor answered forcefully enough, persistently enough. And I think it's time that we change that. Calories versus nutrients, hunger versus healthy diets, these are tough choices in a world where inequity is entrenched. Where a healthy meal costs five times, a meal that meets dietary energy needs through starchy staples, they will continue to remain tough choices. Solutions are there and they will emerge, but only and only we agree to work and honestly work upon reorienting our food systems. The way we finance, the way we produce, process, transport, store and distribute food. At Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, FAO, our nutrition strategy seeks to improve diets and raise level of nutrition through a people-centered approach by supporting and facilitating action jointly with WHO and in collaboration with other key players and national governments. We research on and release evidence, data and guideline on food-based nutrition, including food composition, nutrition assessment, and food-based indicators. We help countries around the world develop capacities to evaluate and monitor nutrition situation, analyze options and implement agricultural policies and programs that impact positively on nutrition. Some advice coming from the FAO toolbox, and I repeat, these are just some of the things that I picked up from the FAO toolbox, include, but they're not limited to. One, we need to reorient agricultural priorities, including financial support towards nutrition sensitive food. It's high time we stop supporting just the big four cereals. We need to step up investment in national R&D for raising productivity of nutritious food. Third, we need to increase investment in improved storage, processing, and preservation to retain the nutritional value of food rather than investing in highly processed foods. Fourth, reduction of food loss and waste can go a long way in reducing cost of healthy diets. And fifth, we need to strengthen social protection for increased food security and better nutrition. These could take many forms, cash transfers, in-kind transfers, school feeding programs, etc. As a global community, I think we have miles to go before we sleep. All reports, all findings, whether it be FAO's SOFI 2020, or the 2020 Global Nutrition Report, or the 2020 Hunger Report, they all highlight issues which we need to address and offer insights which we need to act upon. Our keynote speaker today and panel of experts will take us through many of these issues and insights. So I will stop here and hand the proceedings back to Asma. But before I do so, let me place on record the efforts made by Asma and her team at Alliance and Gabe and our communication team at FAA North America for putting all this together. So thank you all for all the hard work that you've put in and thank you once again to the keynote speaker, Dr. Renata Mia and our panelists for making time to be with us. Asma, over to you. Thank you very much, Vimalindra. And at the heart of it all is building the political will to do some of the things that you mentioned. It is my um, pleasure now to turn it over to Dr. Renata Miha for the keynote address. She is a research associate professor at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University and co-chair of the Global Nutrition Reports Independent Expert Group. Renata, over to you. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm really pleased to join you all today. And of course, a big thank you to the organizers for hosting this important event. Um, I'm now going to share my screen uh, to take you through uh, some of the key points I would like to make today. It is with great pleasure that I will be presenting you the 2020 GNR that highlights action on equity to end malnutrition. 
Inequity is our defining challenge in ending malnutrition in all its forms. Most people cannot access or afford a healthy diet or even quality nutrition care. This access is hindered by unjust systems and processes, holding people back from healthy diets and lives. Unfairness, injustice, and social exclusion are determined by social factors, such as wealth, social cultural perception of age, gender, and ethnicity, that in turn impact everyday living conditions. These social determinants are the root causes of nutrition inequity that can lead to unequal nutrition outcomes. For example, poorer people may not be able to afford healthy food, or such options may not even be available in their communities, leading to worse nutrition outcomes. This in turn can lead to more inequity, as a second person may be less able to work, perpetuating a vicious cycle. The consequences of nutrition inequity are evident. We live in a world where one in nine people are hungry or undernourished, and one in three people are overweight or obese. Nutrition equity is thus our defining opportunity to fix the global nutrition crisis. Everyone deserves and should have access to healthy, affordable food and quality nutrition care, which is not simply a matter of personal choices. Governments, businesses, and civil society are accountable for healthier and more equitable food and health systems and must step up efforts. We need to remove those systematic barriers and create opportunities for everyone to achieve healthy diets and healthy lives through pro-equity nutrition actions. Healthy, sustainable food should be the most accessible, affordable, and desirable choice for all. At the same time, nutrition care, preventive and curative, should be made universally available within our health systems. Now is the time to act in coordination and ensure nutrition is central to any emergency or long-term response. The 2020 GNR was written before the COVID-19 pandemic. Yet the key messages that come out of the reports have a heightened significance in the face of this new global threat. The need for more equitable, resilient, and sustainable food and health systems has never been more urgent. COVID-19 does not treat us equally. On one hand, undernourished people have weaker immune systems that may put them at greater risk. At the same time, Poor metabolic health, including obesity and diabetes, has been strongly linked to worse COVID-19 outcomes. Focusing on nutritional well-being for all is essential. COVID-19 exposes the vulnerability of our food systems. People who already suffer as a consequence of inequities, such as the poor, women and children, are particularly affected by the impact of containment measures, which caused food shortages. We must ensure there is enough healthy food distributed fairly to cover basic nutrition needs, especially for the most vulnerable. COVID-19 also exposes deadly healthcare disparities. Even the strongest health systems are struggling with high healthcare costs and a shortage of medical personnel, equipment, and facilities. We need to fully integrate nutrition into our health systems to save lives and reduce healthcare spending while ensuring that no one is left behind. So the way forward is through strengthened coordination, financing, and accountability. Looking beyond the present emergency, there is a need for preventive public health strategies that pay attention to food and nutrition. We must turn the challenges posed by COVID-19 into opportunities to accelerate actions needed to end malnutrition in all its forms. Poor diets and the rapid rise of diet-related chronic diseases is putting an immense strain on health systems and the wider society. Yet nutrition care is not equitably integrated within our health systems. How do we do that? The 2020 GNR highlights the following critical actions to make our health systems more equitable. Fully integrate nutrition care into national health sector plans. Invest in human resources to increase the number of qualified nutrition professionals. Develop and align cost of nutrition care plans with healthcare financing plans, scaled up and sustained to cover all forms of malnutrition. Include nutrition-related health products like therapeutic foods and innovative technological solutions like digital nutrition counseling. Scale up nutrition services to prevent the root causes of ill health 
including poor diets and physical inactivity. Optimize health records and checks for nutrition care and to identify those in greatest need. Integrate nutrition in public health surveillance systems to strengthen the evidence base and inform targeted priority setting. Transforming our health systems to fully integrate nutrition is definitely not easy, but it's an essential investment if we want to save lives and release the burden on our health systems and the wider society. The COVID-19 emergency makes it critical to rethink food systems. And this presents an opportunity to shift to solutions ensuring that healthy food is the most accessible, affordable, and desirable choice for all. The 2020 GNR highlights the following specific actions to make our food systems more equitable. Implement strong regulatory and policy frameworks to support healthier diets from production to consumption. Optimize agricultural subsidies and increase public investment for producing a broader range of more diverse and healthier foods. Provide support for public transport schemes and shorter supply chains for fresh food delivery products, particularly to the most nutritionally disadvantaged or harder to reach groups. Implement, monitor, and evaluate evidence-based food policies to support healthy, sustainable, and equitable diets, such as fiscal reformulation, school and worksite-based labeling and marketing policies. Hold the food industry accountable for producing and marketing healthier and more sustainable food products through strengthened mechanisms. Strengthen and increase research spending to address major nutrition questions, identify cost-effective solutions, and stimulate innovation. Governments, businesses, and civil society need to work together and be part of the solution with appropriate mechanisms in place to track effectiveness, financing, and accountability. Sectors must work in partnership to develop complementary funding and accountability mechanisms focused on directing resources and programs to the communities and people most affected by malnutrition. Critical actions include increased domestic financing covering undernutrition as well as diet-related chronic diseases such as obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. Increase international nutrition financing and coordination especially in countries with limited possibility for domestic resource mobilization. Invest in data management systems to strengthen data on financial flows, enabling alignment with national nutrition priorities. Establish support spaces for dialogue and sensitize the policy space through lobbying for community involvement, from design to evaluation. Undertake situational assessments to identify bottlenecks and remove barriers to improving nutrition. Establish a global nutrition accountability framework to hold to account those responsible for creating inequities in food and health systems. The report makes the case for governments, businesses, and civil society to enable faster, more equitable progress towards ending malnutrition in four key ways build equitable, resilient, and sustainable food and health systems to ensure that everyone has access to healthy food and quality nutrition care. Expand financing, crucially for diet-related chronic diseases and for research, and direct resources and programs to the communities and populations most affected. Focus on joint efforts by engaging and mobilizing all sectors to act now and target those most in need. Leverage key moments, such as the Nutrition for Growth Summit, to renew and expand commitments and strengthen accountability to monitor pledges and commitments. The COVID-19 pandemic has definitely changed the world around us, but has also made clear that good nutrition is now more important than ever. As governments, businesses, and civil society increasingly recognize the depth and breadth of the global nutrition crisis, they are compelled to act. Fixing the global nutrition act crisis is a collective responsibility. Investing in nutrition, expanding commitments, and strengthening accountability has become urgent if we want to prepare our food systems and health systems for imminent shocks and preserve our future. Thank you very much for your attention, and I will now hand over to Asma. 
Thank you very much for that uh, rich presentation. And clearly there's a lot to drill into in the Global Nutrition Report. Um, a quick question around data. Is global data sufficient at providing the information we need to tackle nutrition inequity? Or would you say we need to go deeper to understand who is most affected? Thank you for the great question. While global patterns are important for capturing the magnitude of the problem on a global scale, such data can actually hide significant inequalities or differences between and within countries. Um, the 2020 Global Nutrition Report uses new and more granular data to go deeper and understand who is affected where and by what form of malnutrition and reveals that even national data can mask inequalities within populations. The report finds clear links between levels of malnutrition and population characteristics like location, age, sex, education, and wealth. For example, um, although stunting rates have been slowly declining over time on a global scale, there are notable differences in national patterns of change and inequalities by wealth, the wealth gap. In Lesotho, for example, stunting decreased by 30 percentage points in the richest group and only by half that much in the poorest group. In other countries, such as Burundi and Nigeria, the poorest groups are left further behind. And what we see is that vulnerable and poorest groups are the most affected, and this needs to be urgently addressed. And though more granular, high quality nutrition data are needed, we do have enough to act. Directing resources and programs to the communities and people most affected is the right and smartest thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the 2020 GNR calls for transformative action across the food, food and health systems. What would you say to someone who questions whether such transformation is worth the investment? Well, I would say that poor nutrition and poor diets uh, are the leading cause of illness worldwide and in nearly all parts of the world, widening health disparities, impacting our economies and our societies. Transforming our food systems as well as our health systems are critical pillars to ending malnutrition in all its forms and achieving nutritional well being for all. This change should be through evidence based actions and increased spending for nutrition interventions and nutrition research to generate the critical science needed to prevent and treat diet related illness. Every day, our societies are faced with immense health, environmental, and economic costs linked to poor diets. Population-based interventions within our food systems and health systems can be highly cost-effective or even cost-saving solutions, saving lives, reducing inequalities, releasing the burden on our health system, and even saving money for the wider society. Approaches promoting healthy eating are estimated to be far more cost-effective than many approved medical interventions, such as drug treatment of hypertension, or even the use of statins for primary prevention of heart disease. Inaction or insufficient action is no longer justifiable and only le leads to massive health, equity, social, and economic burdens. Acting now and in coordination to change our food systems and health systems is the only way forward to preserve our future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Renata will stay with us. And so if you have questions for her, please do um, add them in the chat. And, and now we'll turn to a great panel to really delve deeper into some of these issues. Um, our panelists today are Dr. Stinika Onema. She's the coordinator of the UN Standing Committee on Nutrition. Um, Leslie Elder, Senior Nutrition Specialist at the Global Financing Facility Secretariat of the World Bank. And Dr. Jessica Fanzo, Bloomberg Distinguished Professor for Global Food and Agricultural Policy and Ethics and Director of the Johns Hopkins Global Food Ethics and Policy Program. So I'll start with you, Stinika. Um, UNSCN published its annual report in 2018 entitled Advancing Equity, Equality, and Non-Discrimination in Food Systems, Pathways to Reform. Could you share a little bit um, about some of the main findings and how the GNR 2020 and the UNSCN Nutrition Report are aligned? 
Yes, sure. Thank you very much for, uh, for the question. Um, I think you can hear me well, right? I'm unmuted. Good. Thank you for that. Well, let me first start with a, a general remark. Um, we were inspired by picking this topic because we already knew that inequity and inequality are very persistent. In fact, let's say five to ten years ago, I was speaking maybe in, 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 in meetings where people were still convinced that hunger and malnutrition globally were, were declining, were going down from a positive message. And the challenge was then, at the time, how to reach those final increasingly small group of people that are still suffering from hunger and malnutrition. So inequality and inequity was already there. But now, five to ten years later, we have seen already for five consecutive years that hunger is on the rise again and malnutrition is persistently high, even though you see some, some declines here and there as presented by, uh, by Renata. So what we see, in fact, is that inequity and inequality are so persistent that, but that now we, we cannot escape challenging it anymore. And what we found and what I also see in the GNR and what we also see in the report we did in, uh, in 2018 is that if you want to change that, you have to look at human rights based approaches. You have to take human rights very seriously because as Renata pointed out and as we said in our report, you will have to look at the underlying causes of malnutrition and hunger. And when you do that, you see that very often these inequalities and the, these unequal processes in the system, this inequity, they are very um, interlinked and they reinforce each other and that make them so uh, persistent. And another main finding in the report is that, in fact, mirroring, mirroring sorry, this inequality that is rising, we see a growing of power concentration in the food system. Um, which has to do with, with, with interest, obviously. And these, this growing concentration of power in the system makes it so difficult to, to change the food system. So these three, this, these persistent and, and uh, cross-secting in, inequalities, the concentration of power and the, let's say, the inertia food systems because of these issues are very strong. But let me, let me end with a positive note. Uh, we also see some opportunities for change, of course, taking human rights very seriously. But what we've also noted over the past few years is that, in fact, there is a growing acknowledgement and a growing understanding that these problems are so interconnected and that we need to think broadly and need to work together. And you see already several um, sectors and several social movements are joining forces in order to shift the power balance and in order to start transforming food systems. But I hope I'll get another opportunity to go a little bit deeper there. But over to, back to you, Asma. So getting deeper into the data, you pointed out that the trends are absolutely heading the wrong way on hunger. Um, and these are, these are really alarming, given that we have 10 years left to achieve uh, the uh, goal to end hunger. What, what does inequity have to do with this trend? Yes, thanks. Um, maybe let's highlight another um, uh, report that also came out recently, the SOFI report. Uh, it was launched yeah, almost exactly a week ago. And also that report highlighted the inequality. It, it said that, yes, hunger is on the rise, malnutrition is going down uh, a bit, but, but increasing on other parts, so we are not doing good. But what we also see is that diets that are the uh, major driver of, of, of sickness, of illness in the world, are also contributing to environmental issues and to uh, well, to food systems not being sustainable. So that report and also earlier work of UNSCN says we have to change diets for the better. We have to, to make them more healthy for obvious reasons, but we also have to make them more sustainable because of climate, because of biodiversity, etc., etc. 
But when you do, then do a cost analysis of a healthy diet, then you see that such a healthy diet is in fact um, far beyond the reach of, of 3 billion people. The, the report pointed out that 3 billion people would not be able to afford a healthy diet that, that follows the criteria of not just healthy, but also a diverse diet based on uh, diverse food groups. So that inequity is um, threatening to even aggravate the problem more than it is already. So we really, really have to uh, have to look look at that uh, inequity problem. Um, yeah, do you want me to go into the to solutions now, or should I? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So what what um, I think Tim Lendra also in his introduction already pointed out a few tools that are um, deployed by by FAO, um, and I think that's that's inter interesting because we do see opportunities to change. What I always like to point out is that, first of all, we have to look beyond sectors. So we have the food sector, we have the health sector, and, and uh, Renata also pointed out uh, already how that essential nutrition actions in the health sector are important. But we also have the social protection sectors and many others. But these three, these three sectors, food, uh, social protection and nutrition, they, need, they are working closely together uh, to for better nutrition outcomes. So social protection systems um, need to be very neat and can be nutrition sensitive for better nutrition outcomes. Um, food systems can be geared much better for better nutrition outcomes. Um, let me give an example of what needs to be changed in the food systems. I already pointed out a healthy diet is a diverse diet that ne needs to be built on a diverse food production system. And it is so important that we move away from this monotonous diet we have that is based on a monotonous production system. I think Vim Landra mentioned the four main crops or grains that we need to move away from. So let's start shifting away the investments that we have currently that are geared towards the production of those staples. So basically calorie production and steer them more in the direction of more vegetable production, uh, more fruit production, more nuts and, and pulses and fish, those high, highly nutritious products that are essential for our health and essential for a diverse diet, but are kind of neglected in our current production system. So that's, that's really uh, a shift we need to make. And uh, we will be able to see that if we would shift to this more healthy diet, also the impacts on uh, the environment would uh, would be less and um, would be less more beneficial. Um, also, trade is an is an interesting one. Or let's say the 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 scale of our food systems. What we see now, and COVID nineteen made that also very clear. We have very long and vulnerable and fragile supply lines, and we currently we see uh, a need to maybe go back to shorter supply lines to more local food systems so that it's more robust and and, and it's better um, it's more resilient to shocks like covid but also climate shocks and this is not a new idea it becomes even urgent now but it was already mentioned in the icn2 support local food systems so it's there in all these global uh, governance um, guidance already so let's let's do it um, let, let me see. Well, I have to look at my notes. I had one more point to make. Um, yeah, the um, the 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 subsidies and and uh, let's say the measures, the regulations that governments can take to help governments to make uh, a healthier choice are important I and were mentioned by by Renata. What I would like to highlight is food-based dietary guidelines. We have to go back and look at nutrition as being food-based. It has been, well, let's be a little bit unpolite and black and white here, hijacked a bit by, by uh, the health uh, community only, but it is, should be part of the food community. So we need food-based dietary guidelines that inform consumers and help consumers make 
the more sustain a more healthy and sustainable choice but we also need those to help inform producers what to produce and those food-based dietary guidelines can be helpful for policy makers to help establish these regulations that Renata was, was, was calling for. Why do we promote certain uh, products in a healthy diet and what should be done um, in terms of regulations and regulatory frameworks in order to promote them? So that, those were my points uh, for now. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Well, Leslie, let's turn to the, um, the health sector. And uh, Renata highlighted that part of the solution to, uh, for achieving greater nutrition equity is to fully integrate nutrition into the health systems. How does the GFF engagement in a country help to achieve this transformative approach? Thanks, Asma. Um, and thank you to FAO as well for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, I thought I would just give a very brief introduction to the GFF in case some of the participants uh, during this um, seminar haven't heard of us before. Um, the Global Financing Facility is an entity that is housed within the World Bank. Um, it was launched in 2015, and the intention is to contribute toward the ending of preventable maternal child and adolescent deaths and improving the health and well-being of, of the most vulnerable women, children, and adolescents globally. And it brings together partners uh, around um, the, um, the most um, crucial health and nutrition issues of the day. Uh, we work through country-led plans or investment cases, and um, these prioritize the highest impact interventions that we can do for some of the most underinvested issues. And of course, nutrition is crucial. The contributors to the GFF Trust Fund include uh, a great many uh, national governments, including Burkina Faso and Cote d'Ivoire, two of our countries which actually also receive GFF Trust Funds, along with many, many um, foundations and uh, other investors. To uh, work effectively at the country level, we work with country-led platforms, government-led platforms at country level, which include not only the donors, the financiers, the government itself, but also representatives of civil society, academia, uh, professional associations, and very importantly, the private sector. And I've seen in the chat box a number of questions have come up as to how we can better engage public and privately uh, partnerships to, to address some of these issues. The GFF Trust Fund acts as a catalyst for financing. So the money that goes from the trust fund to countries in support of nutrition and health uh, work through and co-invest in the World Bank IDA and IBRD projects. So that is a fundamental aspect of the model. We also work to align external financing from other financiers in a country and private sector resources. And there's a focus on generating more uh, domestic resources over time for health and nutrition, as well as improving the efficiency of how those funds are used. So basically, more money for health and nutrition and more health and nutrition for money. Um, just wanted to quickly also add that equity analysis is a fundamental part of the prioritization process for the global financing facility engagement in a country. And so very often uh, the, the um, regions in a country that are most affected by child stunting, for example, um, as well, uh, along with um, other aspects of, say, fragile and conflict and violence affected issues are the areas where the GFF works. So equity is really a key um, aspect of the way we work. And we also focus on community-based approaches, which means that that lends itself very well to the issues of nutrition and hunger alleviation at community level. So, Asma, you asked uh, about how we work, particularly through strengthened health systems. And I think, you know, looking at Renata's um, presentation, that's where the GFF has a, has a very important role to play. And I think um, for myself, having worked in, in this area for a long time, I think that the GFF's focus on embedding nutrition and delivering nutrition through strengthened health systems is a real value add. I think one of the shortcomings of many vertical nutrition programs is that they 
do not strengthen the system, which in this case, we're talking about the health system, which is needed to in fact deliver those important nutrition services. Um, most of the um, investment cases around uh, reproductive maternal newborn child adolescent health and nutrition in the GFF countries do have nutrition as a key aspect. And in fact, um, at least five of the, of the um, projects, the World Bank IDA or IBRD projects that we co-invest in are in fact freestanding nutrition programs uh, in um, Indonesia, in Cambodia, and in Nigeria, and several other countries. Um, we have uh, you know, major efforts um, at addressing nutrition. And when we look across the portfolio, we work in 36 countries at this point. Almost 30% of the investments that we make from the GFF support nutrition. So this is an incredibly um, uh, promising and important aspect of the global financing for nutrition. Um, I would say that um, uh, maybe as a final comment um, that uh, we've seen in the chat box as well, concerns about how we allocate or, um, finances based on you know, the indicators at subnational level. One of the key areas that GFF works is to strengthen country monitoring and tracking systems so that we really understand what's going on with nutrition at both national, but more importantly, at subnational level. Others have mentioned the fact that geographic um, differentiation around um, the, the levels of malnutrition are critical for understanding how we can, can make the most impact. So I'll stop there, Asma. Maybe you have another question for me or we'll turn to others. Thanks. Yeah, I'd love to, to focus a little bit on the COVID crisis. You know, um, Renata has ended her presentation on how do we change this crisis into an opportunity. Um, how is GFF responding to the pandemic uh, in order to avert the secondary health and nutrition um, impacts of COVID? Thanks. Yeah, I think probably everyone online is, is uh, thinking about this question. Um, the GFF immediately took um, the position based, in fact, on the estimates that, that the Lancet has done, looking at, you know, if we have the same um, fallout from, from COVID as we did from Ebola, we estimate that there are almost 1.2 additional child deaths and 57,000 additional maternal deaths may take place because of the disruption in ongoing health and nutrition services. Um, the other thing which um, the GIF, uh, along with colleagues, uh, did ran the numbers on um, disruptions to sexual reproductive health uh, services and in particular family planning. And that also is astounding. The estimates are that potentially 8 million unplanned pregnancies may occur as a result of the COVID. You know, the shutdown of services, people being kept at home, and also the impact on, on household income. And that for me is just another whole arena where, I mean, this is an incredibly important nutrition sensitive intervention we need to make sure that women are planning their pregnancies, are healthy and well nourished around the periconceptional period. So these, these alarming statistics really push GFF to take the stance that our job um, in terms of helping what's going on with COVID is to ensure that the ongoing, the essential health and nutrition service packages continue to be developed, that children continue to receive immunizations, that women continue to receive iron folic acid supplementation during antenatal care and so forth. So this has been the, the stance that GFF has taken, that this is a really incredibly important, um, you know, holding pattern that needs to happen as countries have to reallocate funds to immediately take care of the COVID um, emergency. Our, in terms of financing, um, we've stayed the course on the, the co-investments to the World Bank projects. Those continue, that portfolio needs to be shored up. But we have also made available to the bank teams 
um, some specialized funds for emergency work. And for example, right now in Tajikistan, which is one of our countries, um, the emergency response is a cash transfer program. So the World Bank has, has put money into Tajikistan for a one-time transfer to the most vulnerable households with children three and under. And in, so in addition to that cash transfer, we've put together a company measures in collaboration with UNICEF so that all of these households that are receiving funds also receive messaging to think about continued breastfeeding during COVID and importantly to make sure that the quality of children's diets, especially the under threes and under twos, continue to be supported. And in this case, perhaps through the emergency transfer. And then finally, the company measures really push the message around nurturing care, early stimulation, early learning, child protection at this particular time so that we get integrated healthy child growth and development in these most under under um, financed and, and worst off homes during the COVID, COVID crisis. So these are examples of some of the ways that the GFF has taken on this challenge right now. I'm happy to answer more questions as we go forward. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie. Yes, let me turn to you. You are a researcher on bioethics and food security and nutrition. You've led efforts, including the Global Nutrition Report, the Committee on World Food Security's high-level panel of experts, the Lancet Report on di Healthy Diets, and most recently, the Food Systems Dashboard. What are, the, uh, are your reflections on the evolution in thinking around nutrition and equity? And do we have the tools that we need? Yeah, um, thank you, Asman. Thank you, uh, Vinlendra and Gab uh, Gabriel, for inviting me. And I just want to first note, great presentation by Renata and really um, uh, great uh, interventions from Stinnike and Leslie. And it's nice to see a powerful panel of, of, of women, all women. Um, you know, just a short answer and then I'll follow up with a long answer. I don't, you know, I don't think we've evolved enough. We haven't done enough to really address inequities when it comes time to nutrition and diets. I think, you know, we talk about, um, there's a lot of mixing of terminology, you know, we, and, and, and I think there's been, that brings a, a lack of clarity of how we move forward. Um, we've talked a lot in the nutrition world about vulnerability, nutrition vulnerability. To me, that vulnerability is an outcome of being marginalized. You, know, you are denied opportunities because of the color of your skin, your tribe, your religion, your caste, where you live, your disability. And it's a very distinct and different framing when you think about marginalization versus vulnerability. And you know, when we think about equality, which is the term used in the UN versus equity, equality is sameness equity is fairness. And I don't think in the nutrition world, we've focused enough on marginalized populations and equity. And, and you can even go further and say show social justice. And I think the Global Nutrition Report really highlights marginalization and equity very well in a, in a profound way. And I think that's an important step forward, the framework in that, in that report. I just want to highlight a couple of, of my concerns, um, and I, yeah, it's going to be good to hear comments and, and, and trying to build a bit off of what Stinnike and Leslie and, and, and Renata already said. You know, I think that um, you know, marginalized populations have been not denied opportunities across every system, whether it's food, health, education. But we're seeing, uh, you know, clearly the food system really highlights these inequities leading to these poor, inaccessible, costly diets and the, the massive malnutrition burden that we have. But you know, if we're really going to address those structural inequities across every system, not just food systems, um, it's going to be a, a tough ask, particularly in these times of COVID. And if we don't address those structural inequities, and we're seeing that all play out right now in the United States, um, we're not going to be able to achieve any SDG, any of the sustainable development goals, let alone SDG 2. 
um, you know, one could ask if the SDG twos were achievable to begin with <laughs> and why we haven't moved so far, leaving so many people uh, deprived and in poverty traps. Um, but that said, I think we need to address massive structural issues uh, across every system and these systems all interact. Just a couple on the things on the who. I think in the nutrition community, many nutritionists I think will check the box that we understand who is most affected by food insecurity and malnutrition. But if you take that marginalization lens, it becomes more complex. So it's the poor, it's the rural, it's the urban poor, it's the geographically isolated, it's women, girls, children. Uh, it's those that live in conflict settings, those who will be disproportionately affected by climate change, probably the single largest shared challenge that we face in our time along with COVID. Um, but that marginalization lens or that discrimination lens adds another layer of who's most affected by malnutrition. Why are they vulnerable because of that? And why are they undervalued in society? If we don't get to that undervalued, why do governments not value them? Why does private sector not value those groups? Then it's very hard to solve the challenge if we don't understand that. And, um, and it leads to who is then responsible for ensuring food and nutrition security? You know, is it government? Is it private sector? Is it citizens? Is it all of us? You know, who is going to be responsible for revaluing marginalized populations and ensuring they have voice and agency and they're sitting at the table? Um, I think we know, as my, all of you know, historically nutrition was sort of absent from the international development agenda and it's really gained in its priority but not enough because it's still quite invisible to many actors especially when you have competing priorities like a pandemic like ebola like climate change um, it quickly gets left off uh, the agenda because it's viewed as being too complex or there's too many you know marginalized populations so i think one question is is how do we keep nutrition on the agenda? How do we ensure that people feel there's a responsibility? We hold account, ensuring that people uh, are responsible for, for addressing it. And I just don't think we as a global nutrition community have been effective in doing that. I just wanted to say one other thing. I think, you know, if we're talking about fixing food systems and we're talking about fixing the health system and Renata and, and Stinike really present some really good solutions of how to do that. And maybe I'm being a little bit pessimistic right now with the current state of the United States political affairs. So bear with me, everybody. Um, but I'm going to go one step further and not and say it's not just the United States, but any kind of recommendation we have of fixing food systems or fixing health systems for nutrition is not gonna stand on two legs in the current fractured global political environment. If we want food systems to function effectively, equitably, and sustainably during the pandemic and long after, we'll still have other challenges like climate change, the political environment needs to embrace global cooperation and inclusion and minimize political polarization and geopolitical competition. And those are all big words, but they are affecting all of us right now. If you are a researcher, if you are working in an NGO, if you are a data analyst sitting in a ministry, this geopolitical fracturing that we're really seeing play out with COVID is really detrimental to sustainable development and our ability to progress in improving nutrition. And we all need to get involved in the political process locally to globally and ignoring it, pretending it's not there and you can just carry on with your work is naive to say the least. So to me, it all, it all comes together, these issues around inequities 
and the geopolitical climate that we're in now um, is, is, is really a, a time to reflect on how do we value people? How do we give them voice and agency and really get out of these structural injustices? And I, and I think it's a time, we're in a great time of reflection globally right now. And I, and I hope that that's included in, in part of the, the reflecting of how we move forward to really, to, to really you know, stomp out malnutrition because we are going in the wrong direction. And that's not surprising from, from my view of that we are. Um, sorry to be so negative. As, but, <laughs> I'm always negative, but I really do. I, I do feel we're at a, a crisis moment, but yeah. Anyway. I mean, to name the political piece of it, because inequity is decisions that have made, have, that have been made to keep people where they are or to harm people, in fact. So it's important to name that. I do want to get to the Q&A, but Jess, I want to, you brought up the United States mm -hmm. and you have been doing quite a bit of research on, on food and nutrition in the United States. Could you speak just very briefly about, you know, how this COVID crisis is, how food security and nutrition are really tied up in the health outcomes here in the U.S. and, and with inequities here? Yeah, I mean, I think we're seeing this play out. Oh. Yeah, we're seeing this play out perfectly in that, um, you know, these marginalized populations are those that are really uh, suffering from COVID. Um, these, uh, you think a long-term crisis that's been brewing around poor diets, uh, significant obesity epidemic in, in the country linked to really unhealthy perverse food environments, very hard to eat healthy in the United States. If, for those of you who don't live in the United States but have visited the United States, I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. Everyone talks about how they get sick the first week they're in the United States with the, their, the diet. Um, you know, all of this plays out around marginalized populations. We're seeing Black, Hispanic suffer disproportionately with COVID having a higher uh, prevalence of comorbidities. Um, and, and, you know, the U.S. has kind of these two problems. It has this internal problem of, of the inability to, for uh, communities, to, poor communities, but, you know, and isolated communities to get access to healthy foods. But we also, we have this joint issue of this, um, proliferation of our food system into other places. And this model, this model of this unhealthy food environment, quick, convenient, cheap foods um, being proliferated around the world. And for those of you who travel around and you see that, you just want to put your head in your hands and say, how can places like Africa, you know, emerging Asian economies leapfrog over those mistakes of the United States that you're seeing play out right now here. These are the issues of some overly uh, efficient, overly uh, industrialized food systems and, and with that inequities in, in getting access to healthy foods, um, you're seeing it play out perfectly in the United States in a very devastating way. And so it's a great, real-time lesson for emerging economies of how to avoid mistakes that the United States has made and, and who, who has the power in the food system, who controls the food system, who shapes the food system. These are kind of the big issues that Africa needs to, Africa in particular, because I know it so well, needs to get a handle on and, and gain some control over to really avoid uh, the, the mistakes that the United States has, has made. Thank you. Um, I, I didn't do my job as a moderator well enough, but this was such a great panel and there was so much to get into. So forgive me for going a little bit over, but now I'm gonna turn it over to Gabe to uh, help us gather some of the questions that have come in through the chat box. And um, I really welcome 
uh, any of the panelists um, diving in on, on any of the questions. So, so Gabe, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Asma. Um, excellent presentation, everybody. We do have a lot of questions, and I know we're not going to have a lot, enough time to cover everything. Uh, but I think Jessica started to address this question a little bit. So the question is, uh, the need to stop extreme poverty and hunger, especially in vulnerable communities in Africa, has been going on even before COVID-19. The reality is that little has changed. We are still having the same discussion today. Why is poverty reduction and affordative nutri nutritive food to fragile communities in Africa still an issue comparative to other Asian countries? What are we doing wrong? Um, what is the realist? What is expected? And what's realistic that can be done in in Africa in a, in, in in the context of COVID? Um, that would be the first question, and this is directed to anybody on the panel. So. Uh, I welcome maybe Renata to, to take that or anybody who would be uh, interested in doing so. I'm, I'm happy to jump in. Um, maybe then Renata will come in. Um, uh, I just wanted to say that I think um, that point is extremely well taken. Um, and I just, from the perspective or the experience thus far of the global financing facility, uh, one of the crucial things is to enable the voice of civil society um, and to enable civil society to hold governments accountable for these issues. And if a government says that they are going to focus on improving health and nutrition outcomes for its people, uh, through using, uh, say, um, grant or loan money from Global Financing Facility or the World Bank, then it is also our responsibility to enable those same recipients, the ultimate beneficiaries, to hold governments accountable. And I think this is one way that we can actually do more and better. Um, and maybe it speaks somewhat to Jess's points about marginalized communities, but it's more than just saying you, you need to hold your governments accountable. In fact, we need to prepare civil society participation uh, and to support through training, through uh, financing, um, those voices to speak and hold with greater accountability their own governments. So I think we haven't, we haven't figured it out completely, but I do think that's one important area to focus on. Thanks. Uh, if I may also come in, just to uh, echo what just Leslie highlighted, that obviously accountability, uh, not just uh, in a specific region, but a global nutrition accountability framework would be key to ensure any major change and to see, to move the needle. Um, so this is highly critical, obviously, um, in, uh, for marginalized populations uh, or for populations that are usually left uh, behind uh, to, ensure, to ensure that transformative um, change. Uh, the other point I wanted to make is that um, it's not that we haven't made mistakes as scientists. Uh, so nutrition science has evolved greatly over the past two decades. Um, so we obviously know far more now than we did two decades ago. Um, I believe Stanekin uh, mentioned the, the dietary guidelines and this has greatly evolved and we need to acknowledge that. We're not there yet, uh, but um, the guidelines started with one nutrient, one disease. Uh, and now we understand that it's far more than that. It's the, the food uh, we eat, it's the dietary pattern as a whole that impacts our health, impacts our livelihoods, impacts our planet. Um, so, um, and, and we've made mistakes obviously because we didn't have the right tools uh, or not enough science. Uh, we now know so much more uh, and we need to um, start acting, uh, taking that knowledge and make it into, uh, into action. Um, so I agree also with, with Jess that uh, there are mixed messages or mixed terminology in, in many cases. Also in terms of which intervention do I need to implement to see that change? How do I assess the population's diet? Uh, in most cases, that's not even happening uh, or it's not happening 
at all or it's poorly happening. Um, so the, the, the key point is to ensure that we now take all this knowledge, we now take all the science and put it into uh, action. And then of course, once we do have the action, ensure that there is this whole over accountability um, and, and then measurement of the impact. Thank you. Can I add one thing as well? I, I think it's an interesting question because it really gets to why, you know, how, how did certain Asian countries get out of poverty? Like China has been incredible. And I mean, even FAO's SOFI report had to readjust the prevalence of undernutrition figures because they were, they were, they were um, overinflated for China. And China's made huge progress on ending hunger and, 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 and reducing poverty. And there's been a lot of scholars trying to understand the differences. And, and I think there's plenty of pockets of poverty throughout Asia. And I think we can't uh, generalize that Africa is not doing as well as Asia, right? Because you'll go to rural parts of Asia, Indonesia, I was in last year, and it's incredibly poor, is comparable to some rural areas of Africa. You know, and I think there's a lot of reasons for this, you know, early on, when Jeff Sachs in the end of poverty talked about infectious disease in those areas being quite different in those regions of the world and in sub-Saharan Africa being sort of trapped in this very highly uh, infectious disease pocket. But there's been infrastructure issues, the ability to, to get roads through, and rails through the middle of Africa because of different topography issues that have disconnected uh, communities there's governance issues. So I think there's a, a lot of, of differences in how countries went through structural transformations, leaving agriculture and move, moving more towards manufacturing and services. And you can look at some of the Asian economies that did that. Um, but I think we can't just say, you know, Africa's poor and not doing so great. And I know the person didn't mean this in the writing of this, but um, and Asia's doing great because everywhere in the world, including the United States, the, one of the highest income countries, we've got massive issues of poverty. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of my time in Baltimore. Baltimore is a very poor city. And the poverty looks different there compared to rural Africa poverty, but it's still poverty. And it's still marginalization. It's still, you know, poor politics. So, but I think we have to be really... Um, nuanced when we talk about where are things not working and why when we look at uh, different places. Um, just a, an extra thought on top of Renata and Leslie. And, and if I may, just, just one penny from my side as well. I, I think it's Leslie, well, all of you made excellent points, but just to get back to the civil society participation, linked also with the diversity in food systems to which uh, Jess also alluded, I mean, it's not one size fits all, but if we would allow more agency and voice to these marginalized people and allow them to shape and transform their own food systems, I think that would, could make a big difference because then you would have the support, the local support for the food system you'd like to build. And bringing that to, let's say the agricultural systems that we have around the world, very often in the past, these have been regarded only as an income, opportunity for income. Agriculture is cash crops, is money, is good. But we have to rethink that a little bit and hopefully with the opportunity for more diverse food systems and more different views and maybe more voices of women, we can, we can change that in more, maybe it's not the best terminology, apologies Jess, but nutrition sensitive agriculture. So how do we move towards agriculture that is, well, let's call it better for nutrition. I think that's an essential part of the jigsaw puzzle as well. Thank you. Thank you everybody for, for your responses, <coughs> excuse me, to that question. We've received a couple questions that are all related to data and data ownership and data management. So the question is, who should be responsible for data system? National governments? What if national government's interests do not align with the nutrition health objectives? Also, how do you keep data independent from government or political influence? 
as a combination of questions for multiple people about data ownership um, and separations of uh, government interests versus health and nutrition uh, communities' interest. Uh, welcome that to is directed to anybody who would like to. Renata, mm -hmm. do you want to start on that? Sure. Data, my, my favorite <laughs> subject. <laughs> um, well, it really depends on the type of data. Uh, so what data are we talking about? Uh, and also depends on the um, context of a given setting. Um, for example, let's talk about dietary data. Um, since the issue is poor diets, um, and, and others, of course, can come in about other data or finance data and so on and so forth, um, because uh, there, there are many uh, stories I'm, I'm sure all of you are aware of. So um, the dietary data, for example, as I mentioned earlier, um, several countries don't even collect dietary data um, at all. Um, and let alone on a continuous systematic basis. Um, so who should own the data? It, it's important to have a data owning institution to ensure that there is continuity, uh, both in terms of the methodology, but also in terms of the assessment and the analysis. I guess what is key is that it should not be privately held. And whoever owns the data ensures that they are, these are made publicly available. Of course, it needs to be well funded and well resourced to ensure that continuity and, of course, uh, the methodology is correct and, and the dissemination. But I guess what would be key is to ensure that these are made publicly available. One of the issues that we have seen as part of another initiative that I'm part of, the, the Global Dietary Database, is that in most cases, even when there is data, uh, data owners are reluctant to make that publicly um, available uh, and because either they want to um, ensure that first they, they made the most out of the data or they might feel less comfortable uh, making the data publicly available. Uh, so I guess it, I, I would suggest in those cases to have like a clause where if you if you do receive funding, if this is funded, let's say by the government, uh, this the, the collection of the dietary um, data or any other data that it is made publicly available and it's open to critique. Uh, so then uh, there are no such uh, such issues. Of course, there are other cases of, of data or nutrition indicators, but um, if these are part of the public health surveillance systems, then the natural uh, lead would be the, the government, um, because then it becomes part of the public health surveillance uh, system with appropriate mechanisms in place, obviously, to ensure that accountability, to ensure then that that data becomes publicly available um, and can be critiqued. Uh, and at the same time, of course, the methodology of how that all happened. It's not just the data, but how did we get to that data? Uh, how did you collect the data? How did you analyze the data? Uh, in, in some cases, that is or in several cases, this is missing. So we either only see the data or uh, we don't see anything at all. Um, so I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much. And then I can come in um, um, after others have had the chance to give the perspective. Thank you. If it's okay, I'll go ahead with two questions. Uh, one, I think directly go to Leslie. Is research prioritized as part of the financing mechanism under the GFF, as you discussed earlier? Um, and then the second question is to, to anybody. Um, and this is from uh, um, uh, uh, David Beckman. Black Lives Matter is an example of civil society movement in this pandemic to address long-standing injustices. Can the panelists identify one or two similar current movements around the world? So the financing one to Leslie and the general one on social movements around the world. Thank you. Sure, thanks Gabe and thank you for the question. Um, and absolutely, um, in particular, implementation research or operational research is funded through the GFF at country level. Uh, and we also engage with partners, uh, other financiers, other donors around that as well. Because ultimately, I think um, we see that the power of knowledge generation across, well, within a country and then across countries is also a very key aspect of the GFF model, so that we spend a lot of time um, doing now these days, 
<clears throat> webinars and, and knowledge exchanges between the countries so that we ensure that ways to more in, you know, effectively implement nutrition in, this, in, the, in the context of our discussions here, the implementation of nutrition services embedded in strengthened health services is shared and, and knowledge is generated and knowledge is shared because it's not going to do any good if we just simply keep uh, it within the confines of a, of a single country that this is the strength of the portfolio. Thanks. Thank you. And the one on uh, civil society movements or, uh, during pandemic, um, any, any movement around the world that you might identify? And that's to anybody. The Black Lives Matter one is hard. It's not one, and it's a great question, David. I think it's not similar to anything else. You know, I mean, the, the, the mantra of Black Lives Matter is justice, healing, and freedom of, of, of Black population. And, you know, of course, there's, there's, clear asks like things like defunding the police which is a huge thing to do to you're you're asking to defund a, a very structural thing that's been in society since the beginning of the country so i it's kind of i mean it's funny that david asks the question because wouldn't it be incredible to see a movement around food and food justice we've seen inklings of it food sovereignty food justice but we haven't had anything at the scale of something as perf that would ask for something so profoundly uh, uh so, something that would that would ask for such structural changes and i think you know when i talk to my parents who were uh, young adults during the 1960s in the United States when you had the civil rights movement, which was incredibly powerful because um, it had a very specific focus around voting rights and, and, and civil rights of, of African Americans. But it also had an incredible leader, a, a singular leader who you know, could walk across a bridge in Selma, Alabama and then the next day be talking to the president of the United States about how to how to enact civil rights. And it, the movement, the Black Lives Matter movement is very different and it's it's organized and its leadership is structured in a very different way. It's not better or worse, but I don't think we've really seen anything and I could be wrong and I would love to hear from others. Um, like the Black Lives Matter, and I, I, I bring up my parents because they told me it feels very different than it did in the 1960s. It's a very different feel to it of who's engaged, and it's a, an issue that's transcending outside the United States to think about justice overall for those who are marginalized. So I'm not sure, it's a great question. I would like to know if Asma, anyone else in the group just is something to pair yeah. Hi. Jess, what do you, and David, what do you think, um, it's different, but the White Ribbon Alliance and Women Deliver and yeah. all of these groups that come together around the injustice that women face as, a, as you know, as women, um, I'm thinking that the White Ribbon Alliance asked the question, they did this incredible survey of women all over the world and said, what do you want most? And if, this was not about nutrition, this was about health, but they said we want to be treated with dignity when we deliver our children, but actually the number one thing they wanted was clean water in the health facilities when they would go for services and to deliver children. So that blew, that blew people away because that water just wasn't on anyone's radar screen, but something that such a fundamental human right, and again, I put nutrition and food in that same in that same arena so it's it's a bit different but i think that we do have we do have pieces of 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 these social movements that come together but i i think that you're right i think black lives matter is quite unique arab spring comes quite close as being massive changes to governing structures right that was an incredible um uprising as well um Inika, I wanted to ask you about that in terms of um, movements that you've come across. Well, I think Jess mentioned a few, like the food sovereignty movement and the food justice. 
I was just thinking of what we've seen lately during the COVID-19 crisis, which is still ongoing. You see many of these local initiatives that are really inclined to support local producers because farmers cannot bring their products to markets because there is this, well, physical distancing measures and, and roads are blocked and whatnot. And I I think, I mean, that's that's doesn't even come close to, to the, the Black Lives Matter movement, but it does indicate a kind of willingness for change that comes from the grassroots level. And that's what strikes me. And I think if we could cherish that, we might be able to, you know, slowly but certainly move ahead a bit. But maybe I'm too naive. I just wanted to mention it here. No, I think that's a, an important thing. People as are, um suddenly aware of their own ability to grow food in mm -hmm. their own and that you know that might amplify um as these efforts connect um down the road so that's an important one to bring up gabe do we have more questions we, we do have some question um and this is one on non-communicable diseases um that came and i think was addressed to jessica but it could be for anybody else i think we all understand the need for increased domestic funding for undernourishment undernourishment and nutrition related NCDs, but governments don't seem to be on the same page. What strategies or advocacy uh, tools have been proven useful? Uh, it was addressed to Jessica, but it could be to anybody else as well. I think this is more for Renata. Renata's the expert on NCDs. I mean, I can just, you know, I think. Um, I think that, again, you kind of get back to the framing. It'd be good to hear from Renata, you know, in the food space, we talk about taxes of, you know, unhealthy foods and front of the pack labeling and, um, you know, food prescription programs. So I think there's a lot of things being tried with some early evidence that some of these things are changing purchases or nudges in the right direction. Um, but I think there, there's a larger issue in that, Undernutrition has been declining, and we're going to see reversal of that, unfortunately, back to levels of the 1990s, which is pretty tragic. Um, and we still have a, a huge unfinished agenda on undernutrition. But we have this massive rise in obesity and non-communicable diseases, and there's been that shift, right, of, 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 with the nutrition transition. But it's really a, a, a framing issue. You, you, I will still sit in meetings where you hear experts who work in food and nutrition say, we have a moral obligation to ensure no one goes to bed hungry. We are morally pulled to stomp out hunger. But obesity, that's up to the individual and willpower. That's their fault for being obese. You hear that a lot. And we know that it, that's not true. We know food environments, the food system is not helping people uh, achieve the weight that they want to be healthy diets. And so to me, there's again, this issue of political will about what to invest in. And you'll see this in the Global Nutrition Report that overweight and obesity is even less funded than undernutrition. And you know, the the science and the data, I heard uh, Dari Mosafari and Renata's colleague talk about how underfunded that area of research is of diets and NCDs. Um, but you know, I think it'd be good to hear from Renata if there's kind of early promising policy interventions that, that we're seeing um, to address it. But I think there's, again, another framing issue. And if you don't have the framing, you're not going to have the political will and the commitment. Yes, I, I, I agree with that. And I think in, in most cases, people don't realize that poor diet is a leading cause of death and poor health in the world. Like they just don't realize it. And part of that is that for many years, we didn't have the right numbers or we didn't have the right statistics or we didn't have the right data. Um, and likewise for the interventions, for the nutrition interventions or the food policies or the nutrition policies, whichever way you want to call them, we didn't have either the, the, the tools or the science 
to be able to generate that evidence, to generate that numbers, to be able to show that these are cost-effective or cost-saving solutions and how they compare with other standard um, in medical, let's say, interventions. Um, so uh, there's a lot of research that has come out and, and also as part of another uh, initiative that uh, I'm leading with, with Darush Muzaffarian that um, Jess mentioned, uh, where we assess the uh, the effectiveness and the cost effectiveness of uh, food policies across several food um, policy domains. Uh, and our, that work is focused in, in the US, but we've also done other work in, in, in other countries. But there are several uh, policies that can be used uh, from food pricing, such as um, taxes and subsidies, uh, to improving federal uh, nutrition assistance programs, such as the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance uh, Program in the US, to food reformulation such as um, reformulating foods to reduce sodium content, added sugar content, which is also a powerful tool uh, to hold the food industry into account and also stimulate industry uh, reaction. Um, food labeling um, from front of pack to health warning labels, um, foods in schools, uh, in work sites, in childcare facilities, so much that can be done there. Um, and these are all cost effective and cost, even cost saving solutions in the long term. We now have the data to, to support that. And, and I think now the now uh, we can get heard, um, but because if you don't have those numbers, if you don't, if you can't show that this is how much you're actually going to save, not just lives. I mean, not, we shouldn't say just, but sometimes pol politicians need to hear like, "Am I, you know, is this costly? How much does it compare? Am I going to save money or am I going to waste money?" Uh, so be to be able to show that, uh, and likewise within our healthcare system, subsidizing like f um, fruit and vegetable sub um, prescriptions. Um, in, there are so many different tools that have emerged and have been evaluated, and these are evidence-based solutions. Um, I'm going to stop here because we only have a few minutes, so thank you. Yeah, yeah Asma, I'm bringing it back just, to you. Yes, thank you, Gabe. Excellent questions and uh, excellent answers. So we, as we have only a few minutes left, maybe a lightning round of key one key takeaway from each of you. I will start with you, Renata. I guess since equity is, is the theme, um, I wanted to reinforce that we will never end malnutrition unless everyone is treated fairly. And I guess this is key and according obviously to, to need. Um, and this should be to ensure that everyone has access to healthy, affordable food and quality nutrition care. Thank you. Thank you. Seneca. Forward. Be fair, be inclusive. Perfect. Leslie. Oh, I'm much, yeah, much less uh, succinct, but I think that the pandemic, while it has further exacerbated the inequities we've been discussing, I'm going to be optimistic and suggest that it also is perhaps an incredible opportunity for pivoting and for it's overused, but building back better. I think we need to take this bearing of inequities to heart and really work hard to figure out the solutions. Thanks. Thank you. Jess. Yeah, I mean, we have a big moment next year. We have the UN Food Summit. And I think, you know, we all need to find ways to get involved. It's, it's hard to see now the involvement. I think that'll happen over time. We can all be involved in that. But let's champion for not all of us being involved but that we get those marginalized populations sitting at the table in New York at that summit in the front row. You know, the, the youth, we should have a big youth coalition. We should have a big African-American coalition. We should have a big, you know, any kind of marginalized group, they should be leading that summit. They should have the voice. The summit should be shaped around their needs. And so, I just encourage everyone to see how we can foster elevating the voices that um, often don't get heard in these big UN meetings. And so you see a lack of trickling down to, to the communities that need it the most. So let's just fight, fight for those who need a stronger voice to be part of what will potentially be a very big moment in food 
in the next 20 years. So. Thanks for men mentioning the Food Systems Summit. That's great. Um, Vimalendra, final takeaway. You're on mute. <laughs> I'll take the prerogative of being one of the hosts and two takeaways, not one. I think the first point that I take away today from all this discussion is that there are effective policy tools which are available, but their adoption will obviously be a function of the fiscal space available, the political commitment available, and the capacity available. And I think there's need to strengthen all three, the fiscal space, the political commitment and the capacities, whether in the private or in the government sector. My second takeaway is that it's extremely important for us to understand that sustained economic growth is not enough. And we have to work on reducing inequities and inequalities across gender and spatial inequalities in order to increase resilience and improve nutrition standards all around. I, I would take those two as my takeaways today. Thank you. Thank you all so very much. It's been such an amazing, rich hour and a half. We could have gone on for much longer. Um, uh, we should think about that, maybe three hour seminars with such amazing people. Um, thanks very much for joining and uh, please continue to stay engaged on this topic. The hashtag I think was nutrition equity and uh, look forward to continuing to work with you all um, to make nutrition equity happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Asma, Thank you. for a wonderful moderation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you Thank very you. much.